Welcome to PSD's Power Panel. I'm your, ma I'm your moderator, Jason Lumberg, North American Editor, Power Systems Design. And we have a few announcements before we begin. This panel is designed to be interactive between you and the presenters. Later in the program, we'll have a Q&A session and you can participate throughout the presentation. Just type your question into the Q&A text box located below the speaker bios on the left, then click the submit button and we'll answer as many questions as time permits after the panel. And speaking of which, today's panel lets us take a deeper look into GAN and SIG products and what makes the participants and their companies stand out from the crowd. Wide band gap materials have revolutionized the power industry in a short amount of time and nowadays has infiltrated nearly every facet of the industry. Many manufacturers have adopted the technology and sell GAN or SIG products and there's even some who offer both. Initially, manufacturers focused on general purpose components that were suitable for a range of applications. And as those spaces were filled, they then started to branch out into more specialized applications. And that's where today's guests come in. Today, we have representatives from five industry leading companies. They're at the forefront of GAN and SICK development. And each guest will have time to tell us what makes their wide, gamba, wide band gap products stand out from the crowd. Our esteemed panel includes experts from Power Integrations, Cree, United SIC, Infineon Technologies, and Analog Devices. And we'll start off with Doug Bailey, VP of Marketing at Power Integrations. Thank you, Jason. Uh, delighted to be here. Um, I thought that uh, the way I'd start with uh, my presentation would be to go into some uh, a second order benefit of GAN. I think uh, uh, folks have uh, really understood the fundamental benefit of GAN, um, but the, the second order benefits are, uh, are something that I think people would um, appreciate a little bit of background on. Um, so the, the problem with mains power, when you, you know, we make power converters that plug into the mains, and the main difficulty with mains power is that it's not a friendly environment. Uh, the, when you learn about it in school, you see a nice sine wave, but the reality of mains uh, connected equipment is they don't see a nice sine wave most of the time. Uh, there's a, a lot of um, other equipment out there that can create spikes, there are lightning storms, there's um, miswiring that can happen, uh, and you can end up with some very severe overvoltage events. And what overvoltage does in a power supply is it can create uh, an avalanche in a in a silicon device so i showed it, i've got a, a image here this this graphic of of a uh, silicon device avalanching uh, the blue is the current through the device the red is the current is the voltage across the device and then the the black here is the uh, the gate that's driving the device and in this case it's turning the device off with an inductive load and what you're seeing is the voltage is shooting up very, very quickly. But then instead of rounding out at the top and in a, in a, a kind of smooth ring, it's flat topping. And that flat topping is an indication that the device has gone into avalanche. And that means the voltage has been the maximum voltage has been exceeded across the device. And it's now uh, uh, conducting in a, in a way that's not very friendly. Um, if you look at where the current is and kind of eyeball current and voltage, you'll see that there's there's current flowing while voltage is across the device, and that of course is a is a dissipative event, and that's heating up your 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 part. So when you're doing a uh, when you when your device is in avalanche, you're seeing uh, you know if it happens just once, you've got some thermal stress. Um, in older devices, uh, it's less frequent these days, but in older devices, you may see a uh, uh, activation of the parasitic bipolar that can latch the part up and, and that kills it instantly. And if you're suffering repeated pulses of this, uh, you can end up trapping carriers in the lattice and that ends up uh, uh, increasing the, the leakage of the part um, and that hurts your no load performance and it can, um, it can also stress other components in the system. So that's, uh, that's, what, um, that's what occurs in a, um, a silicon based power system. Um, as a, a brief primer on how our systems work in, in a flyback mode, I thought I'd just show you a, a flyback power supply. Uh, and this happens to be a GAN 
based uh, schematic, but it really doesn't matter. The, the topology we use for GAN and for silicon, uh, they are identical, uh, similar, you know, just standard flyback topology. The important thing here to note is um, the, the current path. So the main current is flowing through this inductor, through the transformer, which has inductance, at both uh, coupled primary, secondary, and also leakage inductance. And then it goes through the main switch and then back to the uh, back to the source. So when the uh, when the transistor turns off, uh, if you reach back to your elementary um, EE 101 courses, you'll remember that when the current stops flowing through the inductor, uh, you start seeing a uh, rapid voltage increase. And so just like uh, a, uh, a contact breaker on a on a spark generator. So you're going to see a very very fast increase in the uh, the voltage on this node, and that's what produces stress on the transistor. The main the the, the top um, wire on this uh, in this schematic is where the high voltage lives, and it's just rectified from the mains. So if you have a surge, and, and surges you know, can be uh, just a kilovolt or a kilovolt and a half, or you may see up to four or five kilovolt surges, that gets rectified, and the energy uh, gets put onto the bulk capacitor in this in this particular topology, and so you can get quite a lot a lot of voltage on that node. And, and that's what gets placed across your your um, transistor, whether it's GAN or silicon. So when we first introduced the GAN parts, what we wanted to be very careful of is how does the GAN react in the real world? Uh, it was obviously spectacularly beneficial in uh, in the lab, but we wanted to make sure that it uh, it worked well when connected to the uh, the main supply. So it turns out that the, our GAN devices are, are very robust. We, we specify them to 650 volts uh, for, a, um, uh, for peak, um, peak maximum. But when we hit them with uh, excess voltage, they, they operate in a, in a very benign way. They don't, they don't avalanche. The effect of hitting GAN parts with high voltage is simply a temporary increase in the um, uh, in the RDS on, so-called dynamic RDS on. So the way we specify our parts, you know, in in the uh, is for a continuous hit of 650 volts, and that um, does not incur a penalty in RDS on. And once you start hitting it at 750 volts, you start to see uh, an increase in the RDS on of the device. So we, we call that a non-repetitive um, non repetitive uh, hit. So the way to consider this when you're designing with one of our parts is that you should use 650 volts as the continuous um, or, or the, mo the frequent maximum under normal conditions. But it's perfectly fine um, to to use this uh, this headroom that we give you uh, for surge voltages or any other modeling of uh, excesses on on the bus. So that gives you far more than a 80% derating. So it's a it's an excellent uh, buffer and margin um, that you can use to uh, to protect your systems. So this is a a, um, a model of of a test that we run to to understand the effects of dynamic RDS on. What what's going on here is we, as I've got a normalized RDS on, and that is whatever the the RDS on of the device is. And we have devices at 250, 380, and a um, 190 milliohms. Um, so that's the effect is the same. It doesn't matter what the base RDS on is. We operate it to um, uh, to its thermal uh, equilibrium uh, with 650 volt hits. Then we do a, a period of time hitting it at 750 volts until the RDS on has maxed out. And then we go back to 650 volts and measure the time it takes for the device to recover. So that's the um, experimental 
setup. And I'll show you a little, uh, some data on the next slide. This is, this is what happens. So uh, although we said this is the non-repetitive, uh, 750 volts is the non-repetitive uh, voltage that, you, that you're going to hit the part with, we hit it for uh, 9 million times. So I think under anybody's, uh, anybody's calculation, 9 million <laughs> events is something that is being repeated. Um, but it, what it's doing here is it's pointing out that this effect um, you know, has been well tested in this, this experiment. And the outcome is an increase in RDS arm um, le that's less than 5%. From the from a point of view of somebody designing a power supply, that's that's not very relevant, and it's not relevant in the application particularly, because when you're at these high voltages, you're not using RDS on anyway, um, you're, or you're not using the requirement of the RDS on because the um, that typically occurs at low voltage when you're at a, a minimum voltage for input to the power supply is when the losses are mostly associated with RDS on. And so it's a kind of benign and virtuous trade-off where when the voltage is very high, the RDS on goes up a little bit, but it doesn't matter because you don't need this uh, minimum uh, RDS on to, to reach your goals for, um, uh, for power delivery in the power supply. And then the other thing to note is that it recovers um, after, you know, it looks like 90 minutes or so, it's, uh, sorry, 50 minutes. It looks like 50 minutes or, or so, the, uh, it's fully recovered from this uh, uh, two and a half or, or whatever it is, percentage uh, increase in RDS on. So what, we're, what we've decided to do with our product is we, we've inserted the GAN switches into a product family that also includes silicon switches. So we're using silicon at higher RDS ons and lower power levels, and we're using GAN in, at the higher power levels. And what that allows customers to do is it allows a, a, a very wide dynamic range while learning only one topology and only one device. So if you've got, if you're on this, um, if the, on this transition point, maybe you've got a, a 40 watt power supply design that you're, um, this is this is the adapter open frame, so it's a little bit more powerful, maybe 40, uh, 45 watts or so with our, our size seven part. Uh, moving up to a GAN device, you can get, uh, you know, in an open frame scenario, uh, 75 watts or so, and if it's an adapter, 55 watts. Um, so it's a, it's a big step up uh, for a relatively small uh, RDS on improvement. And the reason for the very large step up is is where the it's an indication of the fundamental benefit of GAN, which is your switching losses are very low. So you know that's why it's a non-linear uh, performance step when you move from silicon to GAN. But the 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 real benefit to customers is you not only have this um, this nice range uh, that includes both silicon and GAN devices. But you also have uh, this increased robustness uh, that you can you can leverage in your product line. All of the products that we've manufactured so far have been uh, flyback uh, power supplies using the GAN devices. We've got five different uh, families. There's um, three basic inner switch type products, which are uh, flybacks designed for power supplies. The dash EP is intended, it's, it's got a, a set of features in it that are intended for uh, embedded power supplies, things like uh, you know, refrigerators or air conditioning systems and that kind of thing for, for the bias supplies and the electronic uh, uh, supplies for those kinds of systems. CP is an analog feedback uh, constant power device targeting adjustable power supplies. The Pro is a really interesting part. It has a digital feedback uh, line on it. So you just tell it what voltage and current you want it to, uh, to produce, and it will adjust its output uh, accordingly in a, in a digital fashion. And that's really targeting the USB PD adapter space. And that's 
uh, where we've been actually selling most of the uh, the GAN devices, uh, the the many millions of parts. Lightspeed 6 is a flyback power supply targeting LED drivers, uh, and that's very, very good for, for ballasts and uh, because you can make very compact uh, ballasts uh, using the GAN device because it doesn't uh, generate a lot of heat. Um, and then the InnerSwitch 3 MX, the MX part has multiple outputs, all of which are regulated, um, and that allows you to eliminate secondary DC-DC supplies, um, which um, reduces the tandem conversion problem where you may have a 95% efficient AC to DC followed by a 94% efficient DC DC and by the time you start multiplying these efficiencies together you end up with a relatively low efficient power system. Uh, this device allows you to get rid of that uh, tandem power conversion. Uh, so it's a, it's a very clever product and works really nicely for things like displays where you have multiple power rails, one of which is a constant current rail or another one is a constant voltage rail. It can also work in appliances where you may have LED drives that want constant current um, at the same time providing constant voltage to the electronics. Um, so um, GAN, we're, we're really pleased with this second order benefit of GAN. Um, it's, um, it works really nicely in situations of surge and, and over voltage. Um, those effects, storms, uh, tropical countries are becoming far larger consumers of consumer products. Uh, you know, India, Southeast Asia, um, uh, Indonesia, those kinds of countries are, um, they suffer some quite violent uh, storms. They also may not have the most stable grid systems in the world. Uh, particularly India is quite famous for having a grid system where um, because of frequent outages, people tend to have backup systems. And when the grid goes down, they engage the backup system. When the grid comes back up, uh, nobody's connected to it. And so that can create some instabilities for the, anybody who did remain connected, and that can uh, damage electronic equipment. So having a little he extra headroom is very beneficial, and GAN, um, GAN really helps you there. Um, you know, there are accidents and then um, even miswiring, loss of neutral, other events where uh, in a new installation, people may, you know, plug in a, uh, their brand new refrigerator and find that somebody's miswired face-to-face uh, -face or something like that and, and you've, uh, you've damaged, your, uh, damaged your equipment. So, yeah, so in summary, the GAN devices, they're smaller, they give you more efficient power supplies, and they're ultimately tougher uh, than their silicon counterparts. So we're, we're betting heavily on GAN, where uh, most of our new products coming out in, in the, in the uh, near term will be using GAN, and uh, we think it, it provides these uh, fantastic benefits. Um, don't know why anybody would use anything else at this point. So uh, thank you very much. That's all I have. And uh, back to you, uh, back to you, Jason. Thanks, Doug. Our, our next speaker will be Guy Moxie, Senior Director of Power Marketing and Applications at Cree. Thank you, Jason. Yes, delighted to be on the panel. Um, I think, as we can all agree, silicon carbide market is is exploding. I mean, not literally exploding, but I think the, we should say the adoption of silicon carbide is exploding. And of course, this is all around the products that uh, people can use. And we at Wolfspeed, you know, have a huge range of, of products and have had for 17 years purely of silicon carbide from dye to discrete through to modules. 600 volts, 650, 900 volts, 1,000 volts, 1,200 volts, 1,700 volts. 2 amps to 500 amps, so for, I think from watts to megawatts we have you covered. Um, and I'd like to walk through several of the uh, major applications that have been enabled with Wolfspeed Silicon Carbide and, and explain why. But I think first and foremost, um, standing out from the crowd to us is not just about having a great product range, but it's also about the depth behind the product and it's the company. Uh, we at Wolfspeed have been adopting and driving silicon carbide adoption for many years. We've been around for 32 years on silicon carbide. 
it's about proven reliability and field hours. Silicon has obviously had 60, 70 years of uh, practicing their profession. Silicon carbide has not. So you have to look at what is the long-term reliability and sustainability. It's about continuous innovation and investment. Um, this market is booming. Depends on who you read. It could be a $10 billion market within the next several years. So who's innovating, who's investing, who has the capacity? And of course, it's proving that incumbent value versus the, uh, the existing technologies. So, you know, silicon carbide proficiency is not just about we have a device. Do you want some samples? So, you know, industry adoption for many years is very broad. But at wall speed, you know, silicon carbide is all around. PV inverters has been a huge industry for silicon carbide due to the efficiency, the power density uh, value proposition it brings. Battery chargers, huge amounts of activity, of course, around on-vehicle EV uh, being enabled by silicon carbide, but we have to charge them. And silicon carbide makes a smaller, more efficient, more reliable battery charger. Power supply, everyone logs onto their internet every morning. Those server farms, those clouds are powered by silicon carbide. And then, you know, talking about a spectrum of applications, even up to trains, our silicon carbide modules have been in trains for a long time. That's a, a you know, a higher power example of, you know, where silicon carbide can be used. We talk about satisfying a huge demand for silicon carbide. Another stand, stand out from the crowd is capacity and scale. Who is going to be supplying it? Who, if you're designing in and putting your, your future of your company around silicon carbide, who can supply and guarantee supply? We at Wolfspeed are investing a billion dollars or just shy of a billion dollars into capacity. We want to be able to make sure that we can supply and scale to what the market needs. Long-term reliability, yes, qualifying a device means a thousand hours. It means a very tough thousand hours, but also it means what's the longevity of that device in your application in the field? We at Wolfspeed have just under 7 trillion field hours of product out there. That's in the market being used today in the applications I've just shown. Long-term reliability consistency is the key Also landscape, it's understanding and enabling a larger landscape, widening the market. And now with 650 volt silicon carbide MOSFETs, this takes a huge chunk out of the available opportunity in SAM. Obviously silicon is there doing a very adequate job, you know, MOSFETs from 5 volts to, to 900 volts, IGBT from 650 to mid voltage, you know, low cost, very commercially available, business as usual type of um, situation. Doug's just went through some great examples for GAN, um, typically around the, the offline um, charging area, flybacks, you know, where high frequency is being used, but uh, generally at lower power, lower voltage. But now with silicon carbide, again, ranging from 600 volts, 650 volts through to 1700 volts and beyond, it takes a huge bite out of the available market and what you can use it for. And just another finishing point before we go through some of the, the applications enabled, it's about value. And this was an interesting slide just updated fairly recently. Um, it just shows sticker price of some 650 volt technology options. This is catalog type pricing, but it just shows there the new silicon carbide from, from Wolfspeed and then against the GAN, an equivalent to GAN part and an equivalent silicon uh, superjunction part too, all would be used in a typically a, a one to three kilowatt power supply or maybe an onboard charge for, for an EV. And it just shows there, you know, to dispel the myth that uh, silicon carbide is always so expensive, it just shows there the actual fact for what would be a better performance device against GAN and silicon, it comes in as a catalyte price of being far more cost effective. So let's just move to why the adoption of silicon carbide is, is so big right now. 
And this is this is a great example of what you know, it can actually be used for. Proven, you know, effectiveness. It delivers the results. This is an EV drivetrain example. So it's a BEV vehicle. Um, 400 volt battery, 800 volt battery, the value proposition shines through. It's that inverter loss against IGBT. You know, IGBT is designed for full power and it has that knee voltage. So when you're driving it below full power, uh, which is the vast majority of the time in that mission profile or drive cycle, silicon carbide gets you anywhere from 40 to 70% lower loss of that inverter. Switching losses are obviously very interesting, but this is not a high frequency application. This is typically switching at 13 to 18 to 20 kilohertz. It's that lower conduction loss that silicon carbide brings. Moving to a completely different application altogether, let's take solar. I mentioned solar before. You, know, you drive by those central inverters when you're driving through Germany or, or through Asia. Those panels are all connected together. They are boosted and then they are inverted to connect to the grid. Silicon carbide absolutely enables this application. We can drive higher efficiency than silicon and it can be far, far smaller. Three times the, the, uh, the, the, you know, as small as the equivalent silicon carbide. This is quite an interesting graphic there. Um, and 10 times lighter weight. You know, not only is efficiency a key thing, but when these have to be installed in their thousands in these large solar um, string systems, each one is above ground. That's a huge second order advantage that silicon carbide brings. Smaller, more efficient, more cost effective. A few other examples of enabling with silicon carbide. I mentioned watts to megawatts earlier on. Um, it really is the case. You know, we can see here a 10 kilowatt solar inverter, similar to the system before, how small the silicon carbide wolf speed version is compared to an IGBT-based system. Moving right down onto the, the lower power, even at a couple of hundred watts, which normally you wouldn't really consider silicon carbide for, you know, LED power supply, we're half the size of what a silicon incumbent would be. Uh, an EV drivetrain, there's two side-by-side -side examples there of an EV drivetrain. Wolf Speed Silicon Carbide in the right-hand side one at 180 kilowatts versus an IGBT-based system at 120 kilowatts. So not only higher power density, but higher power. And then if you look at a typical sort of UPS system at a couple of hundred kilowatts, you see there a wolf speed power module versus an IGBT power module. The, the improvement you can get by adopting into, you know, for, uh, switching frequency, power density, cooling, thermals. And the, the example on the right is very topical. It's an off-board charge system. The picture there shows uh, a 15 kilowatt silicon-based DC to DC system, 15 kilowatt, and then on the right-hand side is an implemented system of 20 kilowatts with wolf speed silicon carbide. These are real live examples of why silicon carbide is making such a difference today. Using silicon carbide, um, you've seen some examples, but you know, it can be dropped in. Yes, it can, but to really uh, get the effects of what it can bring, You've got to think about the design of switching frequency, conduction losses, EMI, gate drive, the components around the system, not only just the device itself. Uh, Morris Maloney, ADI, is coming on later on to talk about some of the activity that they're doing on uh, providing gate drivers that are absolutely great gate drivers that are optimized for the use of silicon carbide because this is what you can get, switching frequency. If you're using a business-as-usual IGBT, you're going to be switching, this is a PFC, for example, or a DC to DC. Um, you know, you're going to be switching at around about 16 under 20 kilohertz. Very effective, very adequate. Implement silicon carbide up the switching frequency to 48 kilohertz. You actually improve the efficiency and you reduce significantly those magnetics, the input line filters, the, uh, the transformers on the DC to DC. The windings come right down. This is where the system benefit absolutely shines through. And just to um, 
to give you a taster, you know, we talk about power supplies, we talk about EV charging, we talk about EVs, we talk about renewable energy, um, all to charge those EVs. Let's think about the future. Once we've solved the problems in all of those areas, then we can move forward to what uh, the industry calls mid-voltage, and then we can take the, uh, the, the challenges and fix those challenges at the 3.3, 6.5, and 10 kV and get us into heavy equipment, grid distribution, smart grid. The markets are just queuing up to be enabled with silicon carbide. So key takeaways are that SICK-based solutions absolutely are, are proven to have high efficiency, power density, system cost, and effectiveness over the traditional silicon-based solutions. Wolfspeed is here as a world leader in silicon carbide, not just with the product portfolio, but the substance behind that portfolio. And Wolfspeed brings dedicate dec decades of SICK-based system-level expertise to help the customers design their systems. Thank you for your time. And Jason, over to you. Thank you, Guy. Uh, next up is Dr. Anup Bala, VP of Engineering at United SIC. Thank you, Jason. Uh, I'm happy to be here to present the latest on our SIGFET technology for power conversion for circuit protection type applications. What makes uh, our company unique is that we are the leaders in silicon carbide JFET technology. Now, JFETs are bulk conduction devices. They're inherently very robust. You'll see a picture on the left of a JFET packaged into a TO47 package, a small chip size at 1,200 volts that's giving you an RDS on of 8 milliohm with a zero volt drive, and maybe seven if you drive it at two volts on the gate. This kind of a device is normally on and generally more useful in things like circuit breakers where you may need a normally on device. So to turn it into a normally off device, which most people prefer for power conversion applications, the picture on the right shows you how we stack a low voltage MOSFET in light blue uh, on top of the main JFET. And this adds some RDS on, so now it becomes a nine milliohm device at 1200 volts. The advantage of doing things this way, the MOSFET that we put on has a very wide operating gate voltage range and it will, and it has a threshold voltage of five volts. So you can use it with a zero to 12 volt gate drive. It's also compatible with all other gate drive voltages as long as you stay within the plus minus 20 volt window. All of the devices have EST protection built into the gate, makes it a bit easy to use. In the third quadrant, gas codes are pretty great because what really happens is the low voltage body diode turns on with a 0.7 volt knee and then the current flows through the JFET channel. The QRR is low because essentially there is no conductivity modulation in the high voltage device, which is the JFET. So all you do to recover the diode is charge and discharge that capacitance. So with all these capabilities, you know, you can ask, what do you, what do you use these parts for? Essentially, you use them for all the same applications where you traditionally find IGBTs and silicon carbide MOSFETs. So I've listed here the automotive sector where there's uses in onboard chargers and DC-DC converters and developing, you know, developing applications for traction inverters the battery charging segments for EVs, the 650 volt class of devices of which we've got a wide variety. Um, you use them in server power supplies as well as in telecom rectifiers. And then again, in the renewable space, uh, especially for energy storage systems, they're very useful because they're very good for DC-DC conversion. And finally, I'll get to circuit protection. So the main one advantage that cuts across all these applications is that we are, we've got a simple gate drive. You can just use zero to 12 volts, compatible with old silicon drivers, compatible with old ways of doing DSAT detection. This has a five volt threshold, so your drive can be, uni it can be zero to 12, but you can also use other drives if you're looking for compatibility. Um, in liquid cooled types of applications, like in the automotive segment, you want devices with low thermal resistance. Now our chips are pretty small because we have an, um, an advantage in what kind of RDS on we can produce for a given chip size. So the thermal aspect of that can be over overcome by the fact that we use sintering technology that delivers a pretty low thermal resistance from junction to case. When it comes to circuit protection, the extremely low RDS ons that we can pack into any given footprint is very useful because often there's no room to dissipate heat and conduction loss is what counts. 
So these devices tend to work great for that. If you use a JFET, you can actually use the gate to source junction voltage of the JFET to sense its temperature as it's being used. This is, a, this is an area we are developing quite a lot because it'll allow you to have discrete or power modules that you can monitor the health of on the fly. No need for, uh, you don't have to depend on the NTC or any uh, secondary method of monitoring. So what we've done with all this technology in 2019, this is the 2019 list. In December, we launched a uh, 7 milliohm 650 volt and a 9 milliohm 1200 volt device in Toyota 47 4 lead. These are absolutely the lowest RDS1 devices in the industry in this voltage class. We launched a bunch of uh, standalone JFETs with very um, small chip sizes for the flyback converter space. The normally on aspect of these JFETs allows you to integrate them pretty seamlessly to um, get rid of all the startup circuitry. You can start up through the normally on JFET. And then because we can deliver such low RDS ons, it made sense to put them into the DFN 8x8 package. So I'll speak to that. And we launched a whole portfolio in the Toyota 47 4 leaded package. And having that Kelvin, uh, source Kelvin gate return is really useful to get clean gates when you're trying to switch very fast. So this is what I was speaking about in terms of the lowest RDS on parts in the industry. These are in Toyota 47 4 lead. 7 milliohm at 650 volt, 9 milliohm at 1200 volt, by far the lowest from, that you can get. All made possible by the fact that you can make JFETs uh, with very low RDS ons for a given chip size. And the primary thing that you can do with this is put it into use in applications like a traction inverter. So we've got examples where people have built traction inverters using um, uh, two to four of these devices in parallel uh, per switch position. And they bring you big improvements in efficiency because the switching losses are very low, of course, but the conduction losses are really extremely low. And like the previous speaker said, you know, when you're running at light load, especially, the reduction in power losses is very significant. So it's about 3x at full load, and it gets up to 7x when you're operating at light load. So this is beneficial for traction applications. And it's been put in practice by uh, one of our partner companies, uh, AC Propulsion, they built a 200 kilowatt traction inverter, very compact, using these discretes. And you can see that they are able to achieve very high efficiencies across the entire drive cycle range. And these same low RDS on devices, you know, make it possible to uh, build, you know, put these low RDS ons into, into very small packages. So the DFN 8x8, it's an 8x8 millimeter surface mount package. You can see here, uh, at the, for the on resistance at 150C, if you look at the red numbers versus the blue numbers, we can provide RDS ons half or one third of what's out there from the competition while maintaining, if you look down in the green, good figures of merit for, uh, for switching as well, the RDS COSS figures of merit. So what you do with this is shown on the next slide here. If you wanted to build, for example, an LLC converter where you were using these DFN devices where in a situation where there's very little room to dissipate power, uh, you can actually swap six competitive devices for four of hours. You end up driving down the losses and getting away. You can, even up to 500 kilohertz, you can use these devices, uh, four swap for six, and also drive down the power losses. So you get... Um, fewer devices with, that take up less board space, you're running at higher efficiency and you're basically dissipating less energy, so you're running at higher efficiency as well. To give you a quick preview of what's coming next, uh, silicon carbide really has a long way to go in this technology generations. Uh, we are about to launch our Gen 4 technology. In Gen 4, we've chosen to begin at six, 750 volts instead of 650 volts because we want to address both the 400 volt and 500 volt bus applications. So here is a comparison, for example, of a 6 milliohm class device from Gen 4 to Gen 3. So even though the radar chart shows that the RDSA was dropped practically in half, we haven't really shrunk, shrunk the chips quite that much. The chip shrink is at the bottom of that table uh, because we have to consider also the increase in the thermal resistance. So you can see that goes up because the chips are smaller. 
But what's interesting is for the given RDS on, the QRR and the switching losses have been improved dramatically. So then the paths get um, a lot faster, a lot lower in switching loss. And this is simply a, a, a consequence of uh, shrinking the device and reducing its capacitances. One thing we've paid attention to with these um, low RDS ons is um, making devices that are more easy to use in traction applications by getting really good short circuit with stand time. And this is a unique capability of our devices because the JFETs will control the short circuit behavior and they can be designed with very little RDS on penalty to deliver very good short circuit capability. So this entire series will be rated for five microsecond short circuit at a TJ start of 175C. Now, another interesting thing that we can think about once we've got JFETs and silicon carbide MOSFETs is giving the more advanced users control of both devices. So you can, if you look at the picture on the right, I've added uh, a thing called a dual gate device where the MOSFET and JFET gates are simply brought out separately. And the value of this is, you know, you could simply just turn the MOSFET on when the circuit starts, if you want a normally off device, and then operate the JFET directly. This has many benefits in, in the way the device switches and, and, the, and the control of the device. But one of the most important benefits is now you have access to the gate source voltage of the JFET, again, to monitor the temperature of the device uh, while it's in the field. So it can be used for uh, you know, monitoring the aging of devices and all of that stuff. Uh, it'll, that kind of device is a dual gate device, and we are going to see if, the, if, uh, if, this is, if these are good to introduce to the market. The other thing you can do, if you drive the gate slightly uh, forward biased, in the case of the JFET, you can drop the RDS on of the same device from 9 milliohm to 7.6 milliohm with no change in cost. And that's all I have. Thank you. Back to Jason. Appreciate that, Dr. Bala. And our next guest is Dr. Gerald Dubois, Senior Principal, Power Semiconductors and Systems Engineering from Affineon Technologies. Thank you, Jason. It's my pleasure to be here on the panel. The strategy of Infineon is a little bit different to what you have heard so far from my colleagues. So basically, the strategy of Infineon is to complement each of its leading edge silicon technologies with a wide band gap counterpart. So our IGBTs will be complemented with the silicon carbide MOSFET technology, our leading edge superjunction technology, the CoolMOS brand. We put a 600 volt GAN technology aside and in our middle voltage transistors, we are doing middle voltage GAN. So in comparison to just putting focus only on one technology, we believe that silicon is here to stay, that a majority of applications will remain in silicon, and that wide band gap is driving top performance, top density, wherever it's needed but a majority of the market will stay in silicon. Therefore, Infineon continues to invest to bring these technologies always to even better performance and to further improve the performance. Let me introduce the three technologies a little bit more in detail. Kumas technology has been around for quite a while. Nevertheless, driving the technology forward towards ever smaller devices, makes the device faster, it reduces constantly the energy stored in the output capacitance, thus making the devices cheaper and better in hard switching applications at the same time. Applications such as a classic PSE, power factor correction, combining CoolMOS with the carbon chocolate diode, clear market, where superjunction in our eyes is basically unbeatable. Applications like the EV charging, which was mentioned a few times already, topologies like the Vienna rectifier, back-to-back -back arrangement of 600 volt switches combined with the filling carbon 1200 volt diode in the active front end, then using stacked LLCs. That is also an application where we believe that superjunction has still a lot to offer. Moving forward into filling carbide, especially in the 600, 650 volt domain. The key advantage of filling carbide is its very low dependency of the on-state resistance as a function of temperature. Very interesting option for the totem pole 
where we see clear acceptance in the market in, for example, data centers. Gallium nitride, the technology as a lateral device with very small capacitances, extremely small gate charge, the perfect device for high frequency operation in data centers, for example, moving the LLC stage into 300, 400 kilohertz, potentially up to one megahertz. So having access to all of these three technologies, we can guide our customers to whatever is best suited for the specific application the customer is dealing with. One slide on the energy stored in the output capacitance. In hard switching application, you want to be as close as possible to the Nakajima limit. So basically, turning off the device lossless. The nonlinearity of the output capacitance of superjunction is providing you like a 200 nanosecond dead time where you can turn off the channel entirely, letting the load count commutate into the output capacitance. The energy stored in that output capacitance will then be dissipated as heat at hard turn on. And as you see here, on this slide, with every generation, we are lowering that energy stored in the output capacitance today close to where gallium nitride is in the next generation, basically being on par, potentially slightly even better. But that is a key topic for hard searching applications, combining, for example, a superjunction device with a silicon carbide chocolate diode in the power factor correction circuit, where we believe that this tandem or superjunction and silicon carbide chocolate diode is going to stay in the market. Moving forward into silicon carbide, as mentioned, one of the key topics is the low temperature dependence of the on-state resistance, making the device a very good um, candidate for operating, for example, at 100 degrees junction temperature and higher. In this case, the effective R is on is significantly lower than that of competing superjunction and gallium nitride devices, which makes the device a prime candidate to optimize both for full load and partial load. So basically, it allows to use a higher artisan than you would typically choose in a superjunction device. Going forward into gallium nitride, as gallium nitride is a lateral technology, you need to pay specific focus on the ruggedness. Here we believe that uh, the concept which we take, having basically a gate injection transistor technology where the gate structure protects itself versus over voltage spikes in combination with what we call hybrid drain structure where you have a P emitter on the drain injecting holes for hard switching. Both topics basically make the device intrinsically rugged and make it a very good concept to, to be used both in low power and high power applications. A bit more specific, comparing now on a totem pole, a silicon carbide MOSFET with GAN. GAN has true zero reverse recovery charge. There is no PN junction which can inject. Silicon carbide has a blocking PN junction. The ambipolar lifetime is very short. So the reverse recovery charge of silicon carbide is low, but it's not zero. As you see on this chart, the reverse recovery charge in silicon carbide is a little bit higher. Basically, what you see in both devices is the QSS charge combined with the reverse recovery charge. And here, clearly, gallium nitride is ahead. Now looking a bit more into detail into the individual figures of merits and how we use basically these figures of merits to position the individual technologies. Reverse recovery charge, very clear advantage, both for silicon carbide and for gallium nitride across superjunction. The body diet of superjunction can only be used in hard commutation in abnormal conditions, a few cycles. It can never be used in constant operation. That is the domain where both silicon carbide and gallium nitride clearly have an advantage. Next topic, the energy stored in the output capacitance. As mentioned, superjunction is on par here with gallium nitride, and we believe that in that domain, superjunction will prevail in the market and will stay there. 
that is valid for topologies like the Vienna rectifier, <coughs> like the classic boost, like topologies as the interleaved two transistor forward. Next, the gate charge. The gate charge obviously is the best parameter for gallium nitride. The device capacitance and the overall gate drive power is very low, basically rendering gallium nitride as the technology to move up in switching frequency. That is the technology with which you want to go towards 1 MHz. And last but not least, the QSS, quite an important parameter for resonant applications like the LLC. Whenever you drive an LLC converter towards higher switching frequencies, 300 to 400 kilohertz is what we see now. Potentially, we're seeing 500 to 600 kilohertz in the future. Here, gallium nitride and silicon carbide are very good technologies to go with. <clears throat> Looking briefly into the application, this is a totem pole, a 3 kilowatt board, basically, where you see that gallium nitride can be used, silicon carbide can be used. The key advantage of using silicon carbide in such a totem pole, where we typically see low switching frequencies, 40 to 60 kilohertz, somewhere in that range. These are applications where efficiency primarily counts. And here the key advantage of silicon carbide is that you can go with a relatively high artisan and still manage in a single device to have a 3 kilowatt PSC stage. Comparing now all technologies to each other, so silicon versus gallium nitride, in a both 12 volt and a 48 volt. So what you see here on this chart is the so-called Pareto front, where you see on the x-axis the power density and the efficiency on the vertical axis. The 12 volt is the two lower lines, so 48 volt are the two higher lines. And you see that gallium nitride is always ahead of silicon. The distance is relatively small. Here we are comparing not one to one, but we are comparing silicon in its best use case, which means com more complex control. So totem pole, for example, in triangular current mode modulation, which eliminates the hard commutation, which achieves zero water switching for the cool MOS. So you pay basically in silicon with more complex control and interleaving of faces on a topology side. If you go with GAN, the topic becomes simpler. The control is straightforward. But you see that silicon is not that far off. We are not talking necessarily about a factor two in density. We are talking about 10 to 15 watt per cubic inch better with GAN. So silicon, if used in the proper setup, the right topology, the right control, is not that far off. Therefore, we believe at Infineon that silicon will not just disappear in the market, but will remain in the market for quite a time. So summing up my talk, <clears throat> Kulmos remains the leading edge technology in hard switching applications, especially in the CCM PFC combined with spread rectifier, also in topologies like the H4 PFC having two bidirectional switches, topologies like the Vienna rectifier, or hard switching topologies like the interleaved two transistor forward. So in carbide, <coughs> we see in low switching frequency applications like the totem pole, gallium nitride, we are positioning in the DC-DC stage in high power, we are positioning in low power, in low power primarily as integrated power stages in the high power segment as discrete devices. Here's the capability of very low gate charge combined with low QSS and zero reverse recovery charge are the key points to go for. That's it from my side, and I'm handing back to Jason. Excellent. Our, our final speaker is Maurice Moroni, Strategic Marketing and Business Lead for Isolated Power Products at Analog Devices. Thanks, Jason. Um, and glad to be here. And I guess maybe for the, the last talk of the day, is it, it lines up well to maybe change the, the topic a little. And, and while we've had some four excellent talks on, on wide band gap switches themselves, maybe you know it'd be interesting for our audience to hear you know 
well, what does that actually mean in the system and how do we support that with some of the, the supporting um, uh, infrastructure, some of the, the devices that sit around the power switch. Um, and I think, you know, from ADI's point of view, um, as we look at the combination of wide band gap uh, devices and their target market specifically, digital isolation such as our eye coupler technology is an increasingly critical and essential element of those systems. You know, we deliver solutions across the application spaces that, you know, all the previous speakers have spoken of. And we see kind of particular synergy in three key markets, namely across the industrial space, the energy space, and the automotive electrification uh, market as well. And as the pioneer of, of modern digital, is digital isolation solutions, our goal is really to ensure that we enable the adoption of the wideband gap solutions with the safest, most reliable isolation solutions available. And we've been doing that for about 20 years. Um, I think Guy mentioned 30 years earlier, so they're a little, little longer in do, doing this than we are, but 20 years of, of providing digital isolation to the market. So we've established ADI as the market leading digital isolation provider in that, we, you know, number one for market share. So while wide, band, while wide band gap devices deliver advantages to all the markets, you know, one of our key considerations is making sure that we deliver the specific um, benefits uh, across each individual market. So, you know, Guy touched on some of them earlier as well, and, and as to the other speakers, you know, in automotive about getting traction inverters, getting them smaller, lighter, so we can extend vehicle range for energy, increasing efficiency, getting those units smaller, um, and industrial, again, improving efficiency and weight. And I think as system designers are looking to implement these systems, um, there's three key areas that I think we're focused on in trying to provide the best solutions for system designers. And I think, first of all, is to provide the highest level of drive and control so that we enable the maximum efficiency and deliver the performance that wideband gap devices can deliver. Um, we're focused on the highest level of protection. We want the designers to be able to push the boundaries of performance while ensuring the safe operation of the switch and the system and the users. And we want to minimize the impact and reduce development time. You know, we want to make it easier for system designers to adopt, adopt wide band gap devices with the minimum disruption to their systems. And I think what you see from the previous speakers is really, you know, a broad spectrum of solutions available to customers. And what we really want to focus on is, is providing solutions that can enable all of those, right? So I think, you know, so how do we help designers? How do we know what, how do they know what to look for when they're architecting their systems? Well, there's several aspects they need to consider. First of all, for the gate driver is the drive strength. So obviously the key requirement is to turn on and off the switch. And from this point of view, gate driver makers typically, typically provide solutions with a range of drive strengths. And, but I think, you know, the warning here is you do need to be a little careful. Many parts of spec twist peak current number, which assumes zero gate resistance. And in reality, their actual drive capability is far less. We tend to provide to list a current which is achievable with a realistic non-zero gate resistance. So where our advice to designers is to compare the RDS on numbers given in the data sheets rather than the claimed peak current numbers to really understand what a driver can supply. And this is probably one of the key questions we get, you know, in terms of from designers looking to implement systems is really around true output drive capability. The isolation itself is critical, and here we deliver the most robust digital isolation with the most proven field hours than any other provider. Um, we've been delivering robust safety, or we're delivering the robust safety while not limiting the performance of the system is far from a trivial challenge. And we'll touch on a couple of the areas that need to be considered. First, the propagation delay. Delays across the isolation barrier can impact system performance and efficiency by impacting dead time. and can also affect how quickly the system controller is aware of errors. Fast response to error conditions by the gate driver needs to be matched by low delays and flagging problems to the system controller. You know, a, fall, a failing switch is not just a, a, a singular event. We need to make sure that the system can respond correctly as well. And then you look at robustness features, and given we're talking about high power systems with very high switching frequencies, it's critical that the gate driver provides immunity to what is happening elsewhere in the system. Features such as Miller clamp, which you know traditionally were, were we thought of with IGBT, still have high relevance in, in silicon carbide devices, especially. Um, and here we even see a mix of, of integrated versus external becoming important. Um, and these can provide unwanted turn on in half-bridge applications, high CMTI. So what we traditionally expected in terms of common mode transient immunity performance is, is being stretched. So the high fre frequency switching that we see in these wideband gap systems um, can cause disruptions, which can disrupt control signals and cause incorrect switching and our data transmission, right? So what, how does ADI propose to, to solve this. So we basically see the need to offer different levels of, of gate driver. So 
you know, we've we've three what we've we've identified three kind of key areas that we want to deliver gate driver solutions in. So first, we have basic gate drivers, which are small devices designed in small package sizes to minimise board area. So a lot of talk about power density, about getting the size of the system down. So ideal solutions for that. But it's important that we still meet the critical spacing requirements for safety. So again, isolation is about providing safety. So while we want to deliver performance, we also have to focus on the safety aspect. Um, the parts, although small and, and, and compact, offer the same high level of performance as our more advanced products. Um, then we have protecting gate drivers, which offer the same switching performance as our basic gate drivers, but we start to integrate some of the protection features. Um, so we can detect you know, when the switch is, is in trouble or when this, there's system falls. So we include monitoring for, for faults such as overcurrent protection. And here, you know, tuning specifically for silicon carbide is important, and we'll touch on that again. And then providing error reporting back to the system, error reporting back to our system controller. Um, and here we tend to as well see you have higher output drive because they tend to be using more higher power systems. And then lastly is our programmable gate drivers, and these offer the, the maximum inflexibility to the system designer. So we typically have the highest output drive, and we typically have the most advanced gate control. And what we mean by that is we have you know advanced methods of turning on and turning off the, the switch so that we can optimize the if the performance in the system. We allow the system designer to control how the switch is turned on, how it's turned off. We allow them to control how the switch or the, how the gate driver responds in the term in response to a system fault. So how does it turn off the, the switch when it detects that something is wrong? So we offer the utmost inflexibility. Um, and we also offer things like the fastest overcurrent protection because we recognize the need to, with wide band gap devices to improve on system er faults and errors and response to those system faults and errors. So one of the things I touched on was, was CMTI. And one of the, the things that we wanted to highlight here was, um, you know, the discrepancies in, in sometimes in what's claimed CMTI performance versus actual CMTI performance. So, you know, from the times of MOSFETs and IGBTs, um, or the, for, with drivers focused on those, we typically saw values in the 25, 30, 35 kilo, uh, kilovolt per microsecond range. As we've seen the emergence of gallium nitride and silicon carbide, improving on CMTI has become a key aspect. So we've seen, you know, all the suppliers, including ourselves, you know, improve on CMTI performance and start to claim much higher numbers. So typical rule of thumb is that you want to be over 100 kilovolt per microsecond as a minimum for, for CMTI performance. And we're starting to see, you know, numbers come in way above that. And a couple of things I'd point out. Number one, you know, particularly take care with, with, with typical values because that, that doesn't tell the whole picture. And I think the other thing is that hidden behind the CMTI numbers might be, you know, really how robust is, is this gate driver in the system. So this is just to show an example where we've taken one of our gate drivers and a competitor gate drivers and put them in the same system and done the same level of testing with the same test conditions. And here you can see, you know, that under all conditions, the, uh, one of our products had minimal jitter with no errors. However, um, on the competitor part, you can start, you can see the, the large jitter effect caused by the CMTI. And these are parts that claim the same CM, CMTI level. So again, it's important for system designers to make sure that they pay attention to these specs and really make sure that they're getting the performance that the part is claiming to deliver. Um, and one of the other most common questions we get around, you know, driving and protecting wide band gap devices is how do we protect them? Okay, I think it's um, I think it's fair to say that this is one of the biggest concerns for system designers. So I think the Short circuit withstand time for wideband gap devices is one of the most critical aspects that we have to to consider. So for an IGBT based system, typically we we expected short circuit um, withstand times to be in the 10 microsecond range. For silicon carbide, now we're talking about three microseconds and even less. And for white and for GAN, it's even quicker. Um, and then you also have the additional problem that the detection mechanisms that were used successfully for IGBTs are not as effective with um, with silicon carbide or with GAN. We don't have the same detection mechanisms available. So the typ typical desaturation region is not the same, is not there for silicon carbide. It's, it's not the same as an IGBT. So we have to come up with new methods and we have to provide um, system designers with a method to effectively protect the switches. So one of the things we're doing here is trying to provide the most flexible solutions on the market. So we focus on offering configurability to customers in a number of key ways. So number one is to be able to adopt the thresholds that we actually detect at. So 
making sure that we can provide the most optimal detection thresholds for um, system designers so that they can um, protect their devices um, as, as um, stringently as possible. We also offer adjustable timing for fault detection. So again, we want to make sure that they can tune the detection time for, to be most optimal for their system. And lastly, um, we offer um, fast comparators. So again, improving the speed of detection um, so that users can respond to the system error uh, in as quick a manner as possible. And responding to the error and detecting the error is one, uh, is one part of the problem. The other part of the problem is, well, what do you do when you know there's been an error? So now you've identified that there's an error. So again, I touched on the flexible way, we, flexible methods we provide to turn on and turn off the power switches. So here again, in, in the event of a short circuit um, event, we offer complete flexibility on how you turn and turn turn on and turn or sorry turn off the device um, to make sure that we minimise the impact on the system and and and, um, and really provide the best uh, solution to the customer. So, in summary, um, I think you know maybe slightly different topic, but it's you know when considering a system around silicon carbide or GAN, it's important to consider the impact of the rest of the system and certainly digital isolation. You know, as we heard from our previous speakers, you know, a lot of focus on 650, 1200, 1700 volt uh, solutions. I think, you know, it's, it's, it's obvious that isolation will play a critical role in, in, um, in these systems. You know, um, the isolation has to support the drive to performance that wideband gap devices deliver. So we have to be enabling the smaller, more efficient um, systems, higher power density, you know, and I think what we're saying for ADI, what we've realized is that that drives a need for improved gate drivers with improved features um, and new features as well. And we're focused on delivering parts that can address the needs for wideband gap devices and trying to help designers with these critical system issues and delivering solutions that help them to adopt the systems easier and faster and get wideband gap out into the, into the market as quickly as possible. Thanks, Jason. Back to you. Thanks, Maurice. Now, before we start the Q&A, please fill out the feedback survey that is open on your console, and thank you in advance for doing so. And just a reminder, to participate in the Q&A, just type your question into the Ask a Question text area, then click the Submit button. So let's see what's come in. Uh, we have one from George, and I'm going to give that to Power Integration. What parameters of Gallium nitride technology are particularly beneficial in flyback topology power supplies for chargers and adapters. <laughs> That's a great question. Thank you very much. Um, the the fundamental losses in a flyback power supply are the, your switching loss, conduction loss, and GAN does a does a wonderful job of both of those. You can get far. Uh, more conductivity into the same package because the, the GAN and die are so small, and so uh, ultimately you can put uh, you can put a much uh, lower RDS on device into the same package, and that's very helpful. Uh, and you don't pay a penalty for doing that. If you if you try that with silicon, the bigger the transistor, the more COSS you uh, you pack in there, and that uh, generates switching losses. So you you know you you end up with a, a balance of uh, of balancing your switching loss and your conduction loss, and you just can't get uh, to where you want to be with silicon. But with GAN, the, you kind of get uh, a freebie on the switching losses because the COSS is so low to start with uh, that you can pack as much um, RDS as you can afford to uh, into into a package. So that's a uh, that's the fundamental benefit. Um, and then uh, as I pointed out in my um, earlier presentation in the panel, uh, there are these um, interesting second order benefits, and one of them being uh, this wonderful property of, uh, of robustness to, uh, uh, you know, to electrical stress. So uh, you, you get to be able to ship a, a worldwide product. You can uh, make the same product for uh, United States, Japan, because you've got low RDS on, uh, which means you, you can uh, Conduct a lot of current, or you can you can ship that same product to India where you've got unstable mains and, and very high voltages, uh, and the power supply is going to work just fine in in both locations and have high uh, high survivability and and uh, low uh, low RMA rate. 
so yeah, that's the uh, um, those are the the, the uh, primary benefits of using a GAN transistor in a flyback. Okay, well, I'm going to direct our next our next question at Guy. Uh, Lucy asks, what are the advantages of a vertically integrated SIC approach, and what are the challenges? Oh, thank you, Lucy. And that's an interesting big picture question. Um, I think we at Cree, and hence all of our customer base, see our vertical integration from manufacture, from crystal growth through to finished assembly of our devices as a, as a significant advantage and a huge asset. I mean, the obvious one is ensuring capacity um, for me in the Wolf Speed division so we can make our end products, but also with the investments I talked about earlier on in further capacity for for both materials and finished devices, um, our materials customers, a few of which on this panel, will also be pleased that we're investing in that. So capacity and consistency of supply is a huge advantage. To me as an engineer, though, what really gets me is our internal ability for design optimization along the complete process. All of our design communities work together and have a fantastic cycles of learning at every step. You know, if you're buying Merchant Epi and Merchant um, materials you get what you get you know but we in Cree have the complete internal ability to optimize every step for a better product our device engineers work with our material scientists in lockstep um, and then when you even look at the further abilities of SICK such as mid voltage three and a half kV to 10 kV moving to larger wafer geometries eight inch you know we are the first to capitalize on those um, big trends that are going to enable this industry. So good question. So we only really see advantages and no challenges of being vertically integrated. Thanks. Right. Uh, here's one that's uh, good for a noob. Uh, Robert asks, would a CAS code type um, FET work well when paralleled? Thanks for that question. So uh, I can answer the question this way. The reason paralleling works well, and I showed an example of that in that traction inverter based on discrete Toyota 47 devices that had four devices, 400 amp devices paralleled to make each switch. The reason they parallel well is because the RDS on increases uh, nicely with temperature, so that makes the, in the, you know, in the conduction state the pass parallel easily. But what's more important is that during switching, the behavior is controlled by the JFET. This normally on JFET has the unique property that its threshold voltage doesn't decrease much with temperature, which means that if you've got a thermal imbalance developing, it's not going to make the threshold of that device go down and then make it turn on faster and turn off slower. That's not going to happen. So this is primarily why the switching behavior also parallels pretty well. And finally, you know, for all the discrete devices we sell, they're 100% tested for thermal resistance in line. So the thermal resistances also are pretty closely matched. So if you put all this together, it makes it easy to build uh, solutions using these discrete devices in parallel. One thing you've got to remember, though, what we found is that using the uh, four leaded devices, it's important for each device to have a resistor in the gate return path. And with those precautions, you know, you can get these devices to parallel quite nicely. Okay, well, here's Thanks. one for uh, Dr. Du Bois. Uh, Stephen asks, to what extent will SIC and GAN respectively, replace silicon power devices in high power and low power applications within the next five years? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Jason. That's a good one. So as mentioned in my talk, we believe that silicon will stay in the market. We believe in the coexistence of silicon, silicon carbide, and gallium nitride. I personally believe that designers will use silicon towards the edge of its capability, so pushing density and efficiency towards what is possible to be done with silicon. If you then have applications which are driving for even higher efficiency, one example being data centers, basically optimizing the entire power flow from AC towards the point of load. Another application is uh, telecom, 5G, where telecom equipment goes away from the cabinet on the ground, moving up the pole, where density and weight counts at the same time. These are classic applications to push for performance silicon can no longer deliver. And these are the applications where we, we believe 
that silicon carbide and gallium nitride will start in the market, will get traction, and from there they will spread. In low power, it's mainly the topic of quick charger for the mobile phone. Um, we see powers increasing. We see that um, the application moves from like 45 watt in the past to 65 watt potentially, uh, even 200 watt. And, and here, gallium nitride, with its capability to deliver extremely high power in a package um, to, to reduce the power loss inside the package, which doesn't have basically a fan. So, so you need to get all the heat out of the charger adapter through convection cooling. These are clear applications where wide band gap um, bring benefit and where we will enjoy wide band gaps in the market. Mm -hmm. And last but certainly not least, we, we have a question that I think is perfect for Maurice. Um, Freddie asks, a system designers are having to balance development activities between traditional power switch technologies and new wide band gap. So how, how do the solutions you mentioned here help with that? Oh, good question. Um, I think there's probably three aspects I'd, I'd point out. I think number one, you know, I mentioned when I was talking about the uh, the flexibility, the the programmable solutions, and the adjustability that we deliver in some of our devices. So, you know, that that's uh, key to delivering solutions that can scale across um, scale across different technologies. You know, whether you're using traditional IGBTs or silicon carbide or gallium nitrate. I think the second portion that we that I would um, I point out would be the you know, we talked about the different levels of gate drivers that, that we would provide. Um, so again, it's easy for a system designer to pick a solution that would, would fit into their market, you know, their, their application needs, their system needs, pick the right level of, of, um, of um, performance and features that, that will actually allow them to move between, you know, IGBT and silicon carbide or GAN or whatever technology they want to adopt. And then I think the last thing that we're, we're doing, which we didn't really cover in the talk, but the last thing we're doing then is, is actually, you know, trying to provide as much uh, reference designs and, and solutions that we can to enable um, to enable the, the system designers to to move from IGBT to silicon carbide, for example, very quickly. And you'll see reference to Wolfspeed there on, on our slides. And we have a, a number of platforms and solutions um, tested with the Wolfspeed devices, um, you know, to allow customers to quickly adopt the, the, um, the, the silicon carbide devices and take out some of those challenges that you you know people are concerned about that the person who posed the question asked about we'd like to to solve that before they even have to worry about it so we've been working with Wolfspeed to do some of that as well so I think there are there are a few of the ways that we're hope, we're trying to address that well thanks gentlemen and and that's about all the time we have for today's broadcast if we haven't answered your question during the live Q and A someone will respond to you in the next few business days. Shortly after the live event, you can access this presentation on demand or visit powersystemsdesign.com for more information. And as a special thank you for registering, you'll be receiving a copy of this presentation. We'd like to thank our panel for taking the time to educate us on the latest innovations in power semiconductors. And we'd like to thank you, the audience, for making it a success. Hopefully, we can hold more events like this in the future. On behalf of our expert guests, thanks for your time and have a great day.